Accused kidnappers Philip Garrido and his wife Nancy appear in court for the first time, charged with kidnapping and raping 11-year-old J.C. Dugard and keeping her captive for 18 years. They entered not guilty pleas. Nancy Garrido was seen weeping uncontrollably as she was let out and had to be helped to a police vehicle. In another stunning development, it was revealed Philip Garrido is a suspect in the murders of several prostitutes. And we're learning shocking new details about J.C. Dugard's 18-year-long kidnap ordeal. Here's Megan Alexander. This is the place where J.C. was held prisoner for 18 years and where police say she was forced to raise the two children she had with the kidnapper. Hidden from view behind this fence is a secret maze with two sheds, two tents, a primitive outhouse, and a shower. One of the sheds was even soundproofed. Police even found the silver-colored car used in the kidnapping back in 1991. The secret compound was so well concealed, law enforcement officers did not find it during searches of the property in 2006 and last July. I offer my apologies to the victims and have accepted responsibility for having missed an earlier opportunity to rescue J.C. The accused kidnappers were an odd couple. And just kind of seemed out there. Incredibly, he gave a jailhouse interview to a Sacramento TV station. You're going to find the most powerful story coming from the victim. You're going to fall over backwards. And in the end, you're going to find the most powerful, heart-wrenching story. It's a disgusting thing that took place with me in the beginning. But I turned my life completely around. J.C. was 11 when she was kidnapped in 1991. She's now 29. Today, she's with her mother, Terry, and sister, Shanna, a toddler when J.C. was kidnapped. She was in good health. Uh, but living in a backyard for the past 18 years does take its toll. Also with them are the two children J.C. had with Garrido. Siobhan Molino, a client of Garrido's printing business, took this photo of the children at a birthday party. What church you guys go to? She said that well, we have church in our basement. I said, well, how many people are in your church? She said, five. I said, okay, well, who's the pastor? My dad and I was a little shocked. The reunited family is now living together in a rented house in an undisclosed location with 18 years to catch up on. The man in this haunting mugshot has a long history of monstrous behavior, including a previous conviction for kidnapping and rape. The citizens should be outraged that a predator like him was free to prey upon somebody else. Only this time, unfortunately, an 11-year-old child. In 1976, Philip Garrido, then 25, abducted a woman from a Lake Tahoe parking lot, took her to a warehouse, and raped her. He had induced this young lady uh, to get into his vehicle. He then tied her up, you know, like the, the cowboys do in a rodeo. Uh, he tied her up that way threw a dirty blanket on top of her and put her on the floor in the back seat, all the time taking LSD and describing to her in graphic detail what he was going to do to her when he got her to Nevada. Today, the prosecutor in the case is outraged that Garrido was released, only to allegedly kidnap J.C. Dugard and imprison her for 18 years. What was your reaction when you learned that he was arrested for another horrific crime? I'm shocked at what this child had to go through for the last 18 years, but unfortunately not shocked at, at the, the depravity of this man. Garrido was sentenced to 50 years at the federal penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas. There, he met his wife, Nancy, the niece of another prisoner. They got married behind prison walls. Garrido's brother calls the woman a robot and compares the relationship to Charles Manson and the notorious Manson girls. Garrido was paroled in 1988, having served just 11 years. He then moved into the home where he built the backyard from hell. We found his father at his home where he blamed his son's problems on drug abuse. And he got all this stuff and that was the end. Couldn't talk to him. No matter what you said. Garrido's own brother calls him a fruitcake and an idiot. Now the prosecutor who hoped Garrido would never be free to victimize another young woman can barely contain his anger. What do you think should happen now? I think he should be tried, I think he should be convicted, and I think they should throw the key away. I want the whole world to know what he, he had done for me. 
Chantel Peterson is talking about a man she helped to lay to rest, a man named Terry Farrell, one of the 343 firefighters who died trying to save lives at the World Trade Center. Terry came in my life. No, this 13-year-old from Las Vegas was not rescued from the Trade Center. This special story goes back to 1993, when little Chantel was suffering from potentially fatal T-cell lymphoma. She desperately needed a bone marrow donation. <laughs> Enter Terry Farrell, a robust father of two from Huntington, Long Island, a total stranger and a perfect match who happened to be on a national donor list. He gladly gave his marrow. It feels good to know you did something you chose to do and somebody's alive today because you did it. It worked. A year later, Chantel was pronounced cured and Terry was delighted. I asked how Chantel was doing. He said, well, she's running up and down the block. I said, like a normal six-year-old. Chantel, this is your Mr. Nice Man. <laughs> and when at last they met, it was a friendship for life between the grateful little girl and the fireman who knew just how precious life is. We work in a dangerous profession, and you know, one day you might walk out the door, you might not come home again. For Terry, that day was September 11th. Chantel will never forget how she got the tragic news from her mom, Sherry. She said that they had found his body, and I go, I start smiling, and I go, is he okay? And my mom said, no. Chantel desperately hoped she could save Terry's life, as he had saved hers. She was getting ready for school. And she says, Mom, is something wrong with Terry? Do I need to give him some blood or something? I wish I could have told her yes. And so the Petersons made the long trip to Long Island for a final farewell to Terry, whose own children, TJ and Rebecca, mourn the man they remember as a devoted dad who always found time for them. I'm sad and angry at the same time because my hero was Killed. Chantal gathered her strength to give a reading at the funeral service for the man who saved her life. I felt his, his warmth and just trying to pr prove that I could be as brave as he was. This is a medal Chantal will always treasure. It came from Terry's uniform, a memento of courage she'll always keep from the man who never made a big deal out of what he did for her. I don't go out and you know start telling everybody, yeah, pat me on the back, I'm a great guy here, you know, because like, there's people who know I'm not that great all the time. <laughs> but there's a young girl from Las Vegas who would disagree with those words when it comes to Terry Farrell, for whom Chantel has some final words of her own. I won't forget you and I will always love you forever. He's the new American hero, the pilot of the U.S. Airways jet who flawlessly landed his plane in the Hudson River. Chesley Sullenberger, known as Sully, is being hailed the hero of the Hudson in front page headlines. Tribute pages popped up overnight on Facebook with thousands of messages of admiration. And President Bush also hailed his heroism. We are very grateful that everyone is off the airplane safely. And that was really what my husband asked to convey to everyone. And of course, we are very proud of dad. His wife, Lori's voice cracked as she spoke of the drama. She is a fitness expert on a San Francisco TV station, and they have two young daughters. My husband has said over the years that it's highly unlikely for any pilot to ever have an incident in his career, let alone something like this. 57-year-old Sully's heroism didn't end with bringing down the plane safely. He was the last man off, waiting the aisles in waist-deep water to make sure all passengers were off. The pilot did a masterful job of landing the plane in the river and then making sure that everybody got out. New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg spoke in awe of his heroism. I had a long conversation with the pilot. He walked the plane twice after everybody else was off and uh, tried to verify that there was nobody else on board. Sully was the right man with the right stuff at the right moment. He's a pilot's pilot and uh, he loves the art of the airplane. This is Sully as an Air Force Academy cadet when he was 22. He flew F-4 Phantom jets for seven years. 
This captain did an incredible job. Uh, he's a man whose hand I would like to shake someday. This is how it looked from the pilot's point of view, recreated for Inside Edition in a flight simulator. He avoids Manhattan skyscrapers to land in the Hudson River at an estimated 140 miles per hour. Courage in the cockpit was matched with compassion in Thursday's drama. Several passengers suffered from hypothermia in the freezing temperatures. Survivor Barry Leonard told Good Morning America the pilot or co-pilot literally gave him the shirt off his back. I actually still have it this morning. I'm not going to give it up. <laughs> Oh, what a difference a day makes. Today, Emma Sofina is safe and thankful she's alive. A professional singer from Australia, Emma was on her way to Charlotte to visit friends when the U.S. Airways jet went down. And then next minute, bang, and uh, I thought we'd hit a building. You just heard the pilot brace yourself for impact. Um, you know, how do you brace yourself for impact when you know your plane's about to crash? Our cameras captured 23-year-old Bill Zuhoski being loaded into an ambulance moments after his rescue. The impact hitting the water was just, you know, the most tremendous impact you could imagine. You know, it, I, I guess my head slammed into it. I, I lost my, my glasses. Still trembling from his ordeal, Zuhoski remembers everything that happened as freezing water started flooding in. For a second, I just thought that I was going to die right there in, in a plane, you know. I was just going to drown. The water was coming up so fast in the back, I ripped all my clothes off thinking, you know, I'd, I'd be lighter, I might have to swim. I was, you know, completely soaking wet in my underwear. Rescuers covered Zuhoski with blankets so he wouldn't freeze to death. The fist pump says it all as passenger Ray Mandrell realizes he has made it to safety. That was a celebration. Everybody made it out the plane. Mandrell was traveling with Renee Williams, a music publicist from Florida. She says she and other passengers held hands in prayer when they realized the plane was going down. The girl next to me, she saw me and she just started shaking and I grabbed her hand and I looked at her and I said, don't worry, you're gonna be okay. We've got angels protecting us. Other survivors got emotional welcomes from their families when they finally arrived in Charlotte. Happy to be home. Nine-month-old Damian Sosa and his four-year-old sister Sophia appeared with her parents on the Today Show. Mom Tess told how a total stranger took hold of her son and held him tightly until the moment of impact. What would you like to say to him? Thank you. Thank you and thank God. Amazing stories of survival from the miracle on the Hudson. They've come to symbolize the anguish of the BP oil spill disaster. Oil-covered pelicans, bewildered and helpless as rescuers desperately try to clean them up. But now there's hopefully a happy ending for dozens of these animals. Oil-free and nursed back to health, they've just been released into the sparkling waters of a wildlife refuge. They started a, a new lease on life today. The release is run like a military operation. Giant Coast Guard transport planes carry 62 pelicans from a rehab center in Louisiana to an airport in Texas. The birds are then loaded into vans and taken to the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge near Corpus Christi. At the shoreline, the cages, each containing two birds, are carefully opened by fish and wildlife staffers and other helpers. The birds flap their wings for a second, getting their bearings, then make the most of their newfound freedom in the pristine waters. They're 400 miles from the disaster and a world away from their previous condition. They get a second chance at life and a new place to live. It's a good place for them. These dogs are among the smallest victims of the Gulf oil disaster. They've been turned into Louisiana area animal shelters because many of their owners are out of work fishermen who can no longer afford to keep them. What they're having to do is choose between their families and their pets, whether to feed their kids or feed their pets. Louisiana shelters are overflowing with abandoned pets. The dogs who are not adopted are often euthanized. The numbers are staggering. In June alone, one Louisiana shelter took in 200 170 animals, 179 were put to sleep. <laughs> but these are the lucky ones. They're getting a second chance. 26 dogs were loaded onto this air-conditioned truck bound for Houston. Once the gate is pulled down and the latch is locked in place, the five-hour drive begins.
At the Houston SPCA, staff and volunteers unload all the pooches. Each dog is examined. They all get a pill to prevent worms and an anti-flea injection. <laughs> At the kennel, Remington is given a bowl of water and just like that is ready for adoption. When I saw all these dogs come in, it just made me so sad. And Mary Oliarm has taken a liking to the sad-eyed golden retriever. They've been through so much to lose their family and they're traveling here and they're in a strange environment and hopefully I can give them as much as their family gave them before.